very glad to be here. Um, we're going to be talking to an amazing woman today. I think we all should be privileged to be in this room anyway with the amazing people that are in this lineup. But this woman, she's been described as an international treasure and I think that, that does her justice. Um, I was on holidays a couple of years ago uh, and I got this book sent to me and it came in this amazing box and it sort of like indicated that this was something very special and indeed, you know, we get sent a lot of things. But anyway, I opened it, I started to read it and it was probably one of the most profound, extraordinary books I've ever read. It's called The Choice. Um, and I think we're all just very lucky to be able to hear from the woman who wrote that book now. Uh, just to tell you a tiny bit about her, in 1944, she was 16. She was a ballerina and she was sent to Auschwitz. She was separated from her parents on arrival there and she endured unimaginable experiences, including being made to dance for the infamous Joseph Mengele. And when the camp was finally liberated, she was pulled from a pile of bodies, barely alive. But all the horrors uh, that she endured did not break her. And she's here to tell us how we don't have to be broken by the things we experience. Will you please give a huge welcome for Edith Eager. <laughs> don't ask me to do that, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Wonderful uh, meeting you. <laughs> we've spoken a couple of times on the phone and you know one of those times in your life when you get to be in the presence of someone very, very special, so on a personal note, I'm just so glad to be here. So thank you very much. Miracles of miracles. <laughs> miracles, I'm here. I'm in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, the eyes of the beautiful people. And I've been getting nothing but love. Thank you, Sharon. It's the woman who's truly responsible for me to be here. She called and she said, we must get together. And I told my doctor, I'm going to Ireland, <laughs> whether you like it or not, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, the question is, of course, uh, the beautiful talk that I just listened to, whether we, whether we stay in the past. There is one thing I can never, ever change, is the past. And life is difficult. Have you looked at your birth certificate? Does it say life is easy? <laughs> Does it say there is a guarantee? No. There is no certainty, but there is a probability. And today we are here in Ireland to give birth, not to new you, but the real you. You see, we're born with joy, we're born with so much love. And then we learn to hate. And then we give up our true self. And today is the day when you can re reclaim your innocence. And this is, of course, I did when I returned to Auschwitz to reclaim my innocence, mm. to assign the shame and guilt to the perpetrator, but to acknowledge that they were beautiful people too. If I would have been born in Germany and someone would have told me that today Germany and tomorrow the whole world, I would have been a very enthusiastic little Nazi girl. Um, well, I was on the other side and, uh, and I'm here today uh, so blessed that God has given me 91 years. And don't worry about the numbers. <laughs> I, I, uh, I celebrate every moment because we don't seem to appreciate, you know, what we have until we lose it. I have such a hard time leaving food on my plate. I, I want to take it home. I want to eat off your leftovers. <laughs> And so I'm so, so blessed to okay. have you um, to interview me well, this I'm, morning. I'm, I'm delighted. Um, for those who haven't read the book, you should all go and buy it immediately if you haven't. It, it really is extraordinary. Um, can you explain about your life before um, Auschwitz and, and what was your situation and, yes. and about how you came there? I think we all have a story. Uh, I'm not my story. 
Um, however, all of us were born and touched. You see, during the war, there was an orphanage and the babies were fed through some kind of a contraption and they were never picked up and the babies died. Yeah. And uh, they found out that the babies died of marasmus, uh, the shriveling of the spine. And there was this doctor who said, you have to pick up the babies. And once they began to pick up the babies, the death rate stopped. So we all have been touched. You know, thank God that we have been, because there'll never be another you. Just remember that God only made one of you, and I'm very much invested to the young people to be a good role model to you. So you're going to be 91 and celebrating life. And uh, stay in school, of course, that's what I would like. I also would like to tell you that I have been traveling all over the world, but I have yet to be ever interviewed by someone like Ray. <laughs> Ray Darcy. Like Ray. <laughs> you love Ray. <laughs> Let me tell you, no one asked me to dance. <laughs> so this is going to be the most beautiful, beautiful That's memory. Great. I want to thank Ray for being such a brilliant, brilliant interviewer. Yeah. I was born into a very talented Hungarian family. My sister, Magda, played uh, the piano. She's still alive. Magda is 97, but she'll tell you that she's 96. <laughs> so Hungarian women will cut a little bit down, but I never did that. Um, my sister, Clara, was a child prodigy in violin. She played the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. When she was five years old, she was the only Jewish girl accepted at the music conservatory in Budapest. And when she was already in a camp, her Christian professor, we need to really acknowledge that, her Christian professor risked his life and somehow was able to rescue her and hiding her until the end of the war. And, uh, and my parents decided it's time to have a son, and guess what happened? <laughs> uh, I was the runt. I was the runt because when I was three years old, I became cross-eyed. My sisters, my sisters uh, blindfolded me when they took me for a walk because they didn't want anyone to be seen by such an ugly sister. They sang songs about me, and I'm so ugly, and I'm so puny, and I'm never going to find a husband. Today, I beg young people, don't allow anybody to identify who you are. You're beautiful because God doesn't make junk, and God has a plan for us, hopefully, to give, to give and to love. And that's why I hope to be a good role model to the young people today. Mm. And I am able to tell you that I, I just kind of was withering away and my mother took me to a ballet school and I had a beautiful ballet master who picked me up and said that God made you in such a wonderful way that all the ecstasy has to come from inside out. But I didn't know that word. I didn't have any idea what he was talking about until I was in Auschwitz when nothing came from without. And the question is, how do you find within when nothing comes yeah. from without? You mentioned your mother there, and I think one of the really, uh, your book is so honest, and you're very frank about your relationship with her. You really were her kind of confidant, yes, and she put a lot on you, and you kind of had to soak up a lot of what she said. And she was obviously a very unfulfilled woman in some ways herself. But on the way to Auschwitz, when you were in the, the car, she, you had, I think, probably one of the most important conversation of your life with her. Can you tell us about that? My mom told me one day, you know, I'm so glad that you have brains because you have no looks. And uh, so be careful that you may still carry those messages with you. 
And so I became actually my mom's confidant. Uh, my father was a tailor and became a dress designer and <laughs> said, you're going to be the best dress girl in town because my sisters were heavy and I was skinny, you know, I was a ballet uh, dancer. And so um, he said, when, when you grow up, you'll be the best dress girl. So I want to say, Papa. Yeah, you know, look, look at her now, Daddy. Watch me fly, watch me fly. And is that better? Okay, is that better? It's not working. This is not working, sir. Yeah, they can hear you. Yes, good. Okay, so I grew up uh, um, with my with mother's the messages that I have brains but no looks, and I have my own book club. Sorry. Yes. It's okay. Yeah, it should be fine. All right. That sounds better now, yes. All right, yeah. Okay. So much better. I spent a lot of time alone with my mom because my father had his cronies and he went to play billiards. And, uh, and my mom read Gone with the Wind and was <laughs> telling me that someday I'm going to see Tara. It's a wonderful, wonderful relationship that I had with my mom. And uh, she lost her mother when she was nine years old. And so, yes, my mom had definitely, uh, I would call it melancholy. You know, she was functioning all right, but I've never seen my mom laughing from the belly. And uh, she was very cultured. She took me to the opera and so on. And uh, in the cattle car, she said to me, that I always tell in the schools, the children, and I say that my mom held me and said, we don't know where we're going, we don't know what's going to happen, just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. I beg the children not to interfere with the growth of your beautiful, beautiful brain, not until you're 25, please don't smoke pot, Please don't do that. Please don't, don't ever, ever take anything other than what God has given us to be able to really, truly cherish our mind. And that's exactly what happened. I lost everything. I lost everything except I had my mind and I had my sister Magda. Shall I go on with that? Yeah, would you maybe tell everybody about when you arrived at Auschwitz? Because that is also a very moving and awful uh, part of the When we book. arrived at Auschwitz, uh, I never heard about Auschwitz. There was a sign called Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free. And my father looked at me and said, it, it, it's probably okay because we're just gonna work and go home. But we were separated right away. And uh, my mother, my sister, and I, Magda, were approaching a man. I didn't know that. He was called the angel of death, Dr. Mengele. It was him who decided whether you're going to go this way or that way. It's referred to as a finger game. And Dr. Mengele took my mom and told her to go this way. And I followed my mom. And Dr. Mengele said, your mother is just going to take a shower. You're going to see her very soon. And promptly threw me on the other side, which meant life. So I am I'm sure that God had a hand in it. So I could be here today in Ireland at the age of 91, having three children five grandchildren and three great grandsons, four generations. To me, that's the best revenge. Best <laughs> revenge to Hitler. <laughs> and, uh, and you see, revenge just gives you satisfaction. It's very temporary, but I believe that forgiveness 
yeah. is giving the best, the ultimate freedom. Mm. So we can talk about that later, but when I arrived in Birkenau, um, someone met me, and the first thing I asked, when will I see my mother? And she pointed at the chimney and said, she's burning there. You better talk about her in past tense. And my sister and I hugged each other and said, the spirit never dies. So that's how I entered Auschwitz. We were completely shaven. It was so embarrassing for us to stand there, completely shaven, and my sister looked at me and asked a very typical Hungarian question, how do I look? <laughs> and I had a choice, as you have a choice now, whether you pay attention to what you lost or what is still here because I can only touch you now. I live in a present, and I think young. So instead of telling her how she really looked, I said to her, Magda, you have such beautiful eyes. And I, and I, and I didn't see it because you had your hair all over the place. You see, I think we always have a choice to find something good, something kind, because criticism will never get us anywhere. So the way we do that in the English language, that I may tell you, you know, you're such a beautiful, precious girl, but I think you have too much pimple on your eye. So give me the butt and I give you an end. Yes, yeah. and furthermore, we're one of a kind, diamond, beautiful children of God. <laughs> Yes. Um, you say, Edith, that everything in life is an opportunity. Everything and in life. And you include Auschwitz in that, which I think some people might find very difficult to understand. But can you explain Thanks. that to us? I think Auschwitz was an opportunity not for discovery, but recovery. Not um, the other way. It's not recovery, but discovery because because nothing came from without. So the question is, how can you find from within? And I have discovered the part in me that I was able to take care of my sister, Magda, because she was more hungry than I was. So I would eat the soup and I would save the bread. So the following morning I would say that I'm not hungry and give her the bread. So I was able to practice that choice and what I'm going to really see that I can take care of my sister. Because if you were just for the me, 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 you didn't make it. We had to reach out just like today. All we had then was each other. There was a, a rule. We had cooperation, but not domination no domination or no competition. And when Dr. Mengele came in the evening and wanted to be entertained, and my girls uh, volunteered me, because I was the dancer at home, I was the one who welcomed the president. And as I was dancing for Dr. Mengele, he was pointing out who to take to the gas chamber. And I remember that I began to pray I began to pray that I wouldn't be the next one, and I was praying actually for him. I also closed my eyes, and I imagined that the music was Tchaikovsky, and I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. Today, when people come to me and tell me, you know, I was sexually abused, but I don't know how I can tell you, because you were in Auschwitz. And my answer to that is, you were more in prison than I was in Auschwitz because I knew who was the enemy. I was told every day I'm never gonna get out of here alive. You see? So you know, it's not happened what happened to us here. But we want to have today a kind of a rebirth that I'm hoping that I can truly guide every one of us women 
because we are not strong women, we are women of strength. Our strength comes from the inside out. Yes, and I'm so, so grateful that I could be the guide. I like to call myself a guide from victimization to empowerment, from darkness to light, and to be able to really give birth to the you that was meant to be free. Mm. You had a kind of mantra in us which you used to say to yourself, if, if you could survive today, it's almost That's like... That's what you... I would say. You see, I had a boyfriend. Yes, he sounded yes. amazing. Yes, in the book. Um, and before I went to the, to the cattle car, he said to me, I will never forget your eyes and your hands. So I would ask everyone, tell me about my eyes. And I said to myself, if I survive today, then tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be free and I'm gonna show him my eyes. So that really kept me alive. That's the difference between Viktor Frankl and myself, because I didn't know how to tell anyone I was in Auschwitz. When I came to America, I was very poor. I didn't have six dollars to get off the plane, and I, I didn't have any, any knowledge of English, and so I, uh, I just went completely underground. And, um, and until I read Man's Search for Meaning, I didn't have the verbal capacity. I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. So you buried everything, really, I when you totally went to America? I totally buried, you know, but it doesn't go away. It just goes under. See, the opposite of depression is expression. And this is the opportunity here today for us to let each other know that we are wounded children. And the questions I ask, I like to ask two questions. One is, when did your childhood end? Because if you had to take care of mommy, or if you had to take care of daddy who was drinking, uh, chances are that you were never a child. So when did your childhood end? I know that I took care of my mom. I became my mom the caretaker. The second question I ask, would you like to be married to you? <laughs> you can think about it. You can think about it. Whether you are a wonderful life partner, whether you are really empowering each other with your differences, because this is what my dream is, that you can be you and I can be I, but together we're going to be much stronger than me alone or you alone. We're going to talk more about that. Maybe just go back to when you were liberated, because you, When you I was out. liberated, May 4th, 1945, <laughs> in Gunzkirchen, Austria, Wow. <laughs> I didn't know I was liberated. I didn't know what was going on. I was among the dead. But there was the GI, 71st Infantry. I revisited that place myself. There is a wonderful monument there for Hungarian Jews. Um, I revisited Gunzkirchen. I went back to Auschwitz. And this is the work I do that we I give you my hand and we take a journey that uh, we re revisit the places where you've been. You relive that life with me, but you're not there, you're here with me safe. Children need to know that the world is a safe place. This is what we provide here today, mm -hmm. a safe place mm -hmm. that you can tell your story to each other because what comes out doesn't make you ill, what stays in there does. I mean, it was many years that you buried it and that you didn't, you didn't acknowledge. And then you finally, when you started to study psychology, you started to Yes, I began to it. study, yeah. you know, uh, psychology, mostly because uh, people asked me, did you love your husband? And I said, love? What, is, what do you mean love? He brought me Hungarian salami and, and Swiss cheese. So you see, we grieve over not what happened, but what didn't happen. When my granddaughter, Lindsay, asked me to buy her a dress so she can go to her dance, I bought her the most beautiful dan uh, clothes, beautiful, I think it was a Laura Ashley. And I went home, and out of the blue, I was crying. And I didn't understand 
understand is very academic anyway. See, that's why we call men thick-headed, because our <laughs> corpus callosum is built differently. I didn't understand why am I crying, and I realized that I wasn't crying because Lindsay went to the dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. Yeah. Today I go to a dance, and I go once a week, and here, here is my dancing partner, and I uh, brought him with me. <laughs> so we're gonna dance today. We're gonna dance. I'm gonna do the high kick, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it's it's. Some of us are born like a turtle, and some of us are born like a rabbit. So if you are a child, and if I am your mom, and you're a little slow one and I'm a little fast one, chances are I'm gonna push you a little bit to do it the way I want you mm. to, rather than learning the rhythm of that child. And I think it's very important for us not to think that the children have to go to school so we would give them a good, good uh, you know, reward, that, that to be a human being and not the human doing. Yeah. That's not what we do, is who we are. Tell us about we, uh, why it was important for you to go back to Auschwitz, because when you said it to your sister, Magda, she was not impressed by this idea No, at all. she told me I'm an idiot, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but Magda is Magda, and for me, I could not do that in a therapist's office. I had to go back, back to that lion's den. I had to feel that feeling. You know, we talk a lot about feeling, we medicate feeling, we do anything with feeling except feeling, yeah. the feeling, okay? <laughs> and today I think it's going to be that you may revisit the places where you've been and you realize that somehow you made it. So the question is not why me, the question is what now? What now? And this conference to me, I think it was, was God wish for me to be here as the 91 year, year old and let you know that thank you for choosing life because I was very suicidal after I was liberated and I was in a hospital and I was in a cast and I got up in the morning and I didn't say what, but what for. You know, there, there was nothing to look forward to. And I'm so proud today of my ancestry, and I'm sure women didn't have it as good as we do, and they made it. Yeah. So we must be truly proud of our heritage. I am very, very proud of mine, mine that I'm here today and writing the book to really honor my parents, my parents, yeah. so that they didn't die in vain. Well, when you went back to Auschwitz, for me, it was one of the most, um, difficult to read parts of the book in a way. I had to actually put it down and come back. I was, I was just very upset. But you came back. I came back, I came, came back. back. I did. back. I did come back. You came but back. I, I, um, I just, I curiosity think, helped me in yeah. Auschwitz more than anything else. <laughs> I am so curious. I always want to know what's going to happen next. Yeah. So taking my life is out of the question, <laughs> no matter what the situation. Um, but you were there and you, you, you sort of reveal a memory that you hadn't revealed previously in the book exactly. about being in that line uh, with your sister and your parents and your mum on the other side. Can you tell us about that, um, about what, what you said to, what Mengele asked you and what you said to him? Well, Mengele told me, you know, uh, when I was separated, that I'm gonna see my mother very soon, it's just that, yes. But then I saw him in the evening and I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who he was. And when I was finished dancing, he gave me a piece of bread. And what is important about that piece of bread, that I was sharing it with everyone. And when I was taken, what is called today the death march from, from Mauthausen, Austria. I was taken out of Auschwitz December 1944. I became a slave laborer. I carried ammunition on a train and um, we were bombed anyway. 
many people died around me, and, and we ended up in Mauthausen in front of the crematorium. And, and then they changed their minds, and I survived what is called today the death march. And so if you stopped, you were shot right away. I revisited that place. I saw the ditches there. I could have been there. I began to slow down. And the girls that I shared the bread with, isn't that amazing? That they formed a chair with their arms and they carried me so I wouldn't die. Yeah. All we had was each other then and all we have is each other now. So I think that is important, that if you were just for the me, 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 you didn't make it. And you talked about sort of, so you've talked a lot about survivor's guilt. And when you were in that line and mm -hmm. Mangala asked you, is this your mother? It, uh, yes, I never could forgive myself. I'm still working on that because he asked, is she your mother or is she your sister? And unfortunately, I said, she's my mother. My mother was in her 40s, you know, but she had all gray hair. You know, it's not like me. I, I'm all fakey, you know, with my hair painted every three weeks or something. I'm high maintenance woman. <laughs> like that. High yeah, maintenance. For the high maintenance. <laughs> but you see, uh, you can be pretty outside but unless you're pretty in the inside, unless you speak from the heart and soul, and that's what I bring here to you, that I am a survivor. I don't have time to be a victim. It's not who, who I am. Uh, as I said in the interview, it's not my identity. It's uh, what was done to you, and if you were, sexually abused, you were far more in prison than I was in Auschwitz because I knew exactly who was the enemy. And so for us to share today, to really not to depress because it doesn't go away, that this is a kind of a cleansing today as well that you do not carry with you anymore the past hurts or failures. I do a lot of guided imagery with my patient. I ask them to close their eyes and then bury. Bury the past hurts, the failures, and to be able to leave it there. They don't have to yank it up again. And if your abuser is in the cemetery, you say it's cemetery, uh, Please go out, take off your shoes, and make, make content so, so your mother or father can rest in peace. And you can also let go, let God. What we do, we do what is humanly possible. I think we need to let go of the need for approval of other people. We need to let go of perfectionism. And I think today is the day when you switch gears, but then you have to release the clutch. What are you willing to give up? There is a price for everything to yeah. pay. So there is grieving, feeling, and healing. You can't heal what you don't feel. Yeah, you, you've helped so many people, Edith, in your work then, because half of the book is your story from uh, being in Auschwitz, and then you go on to talk about the people you've helped. And I'd love you to share with that with us a bit, because you have transformed people's lives. And it must be difficult. You go in to get help from someone like Edith, who's been in Auschwitz, and you're kind of going, nothing I say is going to be. You must get that a lot. Well, it's up to us women. We're very good providing a place where people can feel any feeling without the fear of being judged. Shall I give you an example of that? I had a 14-year-old young man. I'm going to tell you the difference between reacting or responding. Because when you react, you shoot from the hip. And uh, I had this 14-year-old young boy, and he told me he's a boot boy. And, and I acknowledged his boots, and they were brown boots, and, and he wore a brown shirt. But I didn't make anything of it until he got up. He put his uh, uh, elbow on my desk and said the following. May I yes. quote what he said? 
He said, it's time for America to be white again. I'm going to kill all the Jews, all the niggers, using the N-word, all the Jews, all the niggers, all the Mexicans, and all the chinkos. And uh, if I would have reacted, I probably would have gotten up and shaken up that boy, <laughs> shaken up that boy and telling him, who do you think you're talking to? I saw my mother in Auschwitz going to the gas chamber. But I think God sends people my way. People don't come to me, they're sent to me. Sharon was sent to me. So I asked God, what is this all about? And God said, find the bigot in you. And I said, God, I'm not a bigot. I came to America. I didn't speak a word of English. I worked in a factory, and I discovered that there was a bathroom called, you know, the colored bathroom. And I realized, oh my God, after Nazi Germany, Communist Russia, here I'm coming to America. So I always went to the colored bathroom, pretending I don't know from nothing, as we say, in Texas. Uh, I joined the NAACP, I had marched with Martin Luther King. So I'm telling God, you know, I'm explaining that I'm not a bigot, and God said, find the bigot in you. And not until I looked at this young boy who's 14 and gave up all his freedom to a man called David Koresh. Okay? And not until I was able to change and provide the atmosphere where he could feel any feelings with me. And I opened myself up. I looked at him. You know, I can kill you with my eyes, <laughs> and I can love you, and I can smile with my Irish eyes. <laughs> And I told him three words, tell me more. I think love is T-I-M-E, and I think that today we learn also how to listen to our voices, because the way you get up in the morning and you go to the bathroom and the way you talk to yourself changes your whole body chemistry, your self-dialogue. Remember that, remember that. And grief is not an illness. It's not clinical depression, but there is such a thing as, as medication when you really have to work very well with someone who does that every day and talking therapy may just not be enough. Yeah, um, speaking about America and life in America, can we mention the person in charge of America at the moment and what you think about him? You know, I, um, I hope that somehow everything will be a learning experience for all of us. And I, I don't know enough politics, you know. I am in my office. I don't really read enough to, to have a, a, a place in me where I feel knowledgeable enough, because I'm busy saving lives, and I think that I can, I can do that, and I hope I can do that well. One of the big so. themes here over the next couple of days is going to be uh, about violent relationships and women trying to survive yes, them. Yes, I think that is and what you've I with have been working with. I have built transitional living centers for better wives. Uh, I'm for something, a lot of for something. Uh, uh, you know, I don't see mothers and fathers the same way. I think, I think a mother has to be grounded, you know, and that's the first woman a boy sees. There's a different relationship, but I don't see the father and son the same way. I think the son looks at dad in a more competitive way and says, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like him, or I want to be everything he's not. Can you relate to that? Yeah. So he grows up, and he said, well, I'm going to go into the healing art profession, even though my father wants me to join the million-dollar business or a doctor. 
and that's no problem because he's giving up his need for his father approval. But when he said, I'm never going to be like him, he is still fighting against wanting to prove something. And if you want to prove something, you're still a prisoner. Yeah. So I think that's a good point for, for man to realize that when you put your hand on a woman, and if she doesn't leave the first time, he'll never take her seriously. But she believes that somehow she's nothing without him. So I do a lot of education yeah. with premarital therapy. Yeah. I talk sex, money, in-laws, all the kind of things. Don't marry because you're in love. In love is a chemical high, and lonely people get it from chocolate. So uh, <laughs> it's temporary. I'm not knocking it. It can lead, it can lead to a loving relationship. But yeah. marry your best friend. But you're very strong on boundaries as well in relationships. I'm very strong in setting healthy boundaries. And what is a, a deal breaker? And you ask people a to A man list does those. not put his hand on a woman. He leaves that room. And she doesn't do that either. And I think couples need to know how to negotiate and how to compromise. Hmm. If you're not willing to do that, don't get married, okay? Yeah. I think we marry many times, like Romeo and Juliet. We marry someone we don't know. We marry an image of a person and then assign the traits to them what we crave for. Mm. It's better to be a whole person who marries another whole person rather than half and half. Mm. It doesn't work that way. I'm going to take some questions um, in, in a moment, but you wanted to talk about how we can give birth to ourselves. Can you yes. just give us that message of hope? Yes, you're all on? pregnant. <laughs> yes. yes, you're all pregnant and you're going to give birth to the you, that the genuine, beautiful, true you that, uh, that was born with love and born with uh, lots and lots of joy. And I hope that I can really promote that. Yeah. You're a wonderful interviewer oh, too. She's so and, kind. You know, um, I can so talk for three days, <laughs> Nansa. And uh, well, there's there's some brilliant questions coming in, and actually, the first one is about forgiveness. And can yeah. you talk a bit more about that? Because that has been a huge part of your spiritual recovery, hasn't it? Yes, there is the IQ, the EQ, and there is the S, the spiritual, a spiritual. And as I was coming here. I noticed that the pilot was going up and up and up and, 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 and somehow passing all the clouds. And I think that's what I do. <laughs> I guide someone to somehow recognize that the blue sky has been always there. See how you can reclaim your innocence yeah. and assign the shame and guilt, but then you acknowledge that forgiveness is not me forgiving you for what you did to me. I don't have such godly powers, but I know that I want to acknowledge that something I need to let go of in order for me to reclaim my innocence and not allow anyone to take residence in my body. So this is, uh, this is very important that I am not God, I'm just human. And so I am giving myself a gift yeah. that I don't have to the, uh, carry anything anyone in me who's not even paying rent <laughs> and, uh, and reclaim that freedom yeah. to choose how you're going to love thy enemies and pray for them. I did pray for the guards in Auschwitz and I was with God's guidance. I was able to change the hatred into pity, mm. but there is no forgiveness without rage. Yeah, rage is important. No, 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 don't cover anger, but don't get stuck in it. I go through the valley of, valley of the shadow of that, but I don't camp there. Yeah. I don't set up household there. No. 
Yeah. Um, we probably have time for two questions. One of them is, what does freedom mean to you? Maybe just a quick answer to that. What does freedom mean? Freedom means that I can pay attention to my thinking and I also, hopefully, you can think about your thinking and your thinking creates your feeling that I'm free to think about my thinking and feel my feelings, any feelings. So when I'm angry, I invite the anger and I can feel that feeling and then I release it. So I don't run anymore. I don't, I don't run anymore. I invite any feelings and don't judge it. It's not the right feeling or wrong feeling. It's just a feeling and to be able to not to run anymore as I did for at least 40 years. Have you any advice for young women today? The young women today is stay in school, become emotionally, financially independent, so you can marry someone who is your equal. Because many, yeah, yeah, yeah and, and ask yourself two questions. Am I gonna be empowered with that person? or am I gonna be depleted, you know? That you don't become the mommy or the or student and, and that love is, my definition of love is the ability to let go. To let go of the fear, because every time you're angry, you have a lot of fear underneath it, and the biggest fear of a child is the fear of abandonment. But if you're not happy alone, believe me, you won't be happy with anyone else. Self-love is self-care, it's not narcissistic. <laughs> yes. And, and finally, Ida, before we go, and thank you so much, it's been oh. absolutely Oh, beautiful. you were a wonderful, oh, thank you. wonderful. Well, what is your biggest wish for the world now, then? The biggest wish, uh, the wish for me is, uh, I was with Martin Luther King in 1963 in Washington, with the mamas and the papas. Yay, with the, the mamas, mamas and the papas. <laughs> See, I go back. <laughs> and my wish is for us to create the human family that we hold hand in hand, that we empower each other with our differences, that I can be I and you can be you, but together we're going to be much stronger than me alone or you alone. That's my wish. And I do everything my power because, you know, I think about how do I want to be remembered. I want to be remembered that I did everything in my power to see to it that your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren will never, ever experience what I did. God love you. Today is going to be different from any other day because it's time to give birth to the you that was meant to be free. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Stand up there. Stand. <laughs> Do another high kick. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> another high kick. <laughs>